Now I didn't have um, anybody ask any questions about the 2.3 video. So the discussion is still open. So if you do have questions later, you can go into that discussion, watch the video and um, comment whatever your questions are. Um, and then I did extend the 2.3 since no one had worked on it. Um, I think only one person had done it and I think they had done it like a while back. So um, nobody had finished it on Friday. So I extended it until tomorrow night. So you should be able to take the part one that we did in class together, look at the part two video. If any of that does not make sense, message me and let me know so I can clarify. And then that way you can turn in the 2.3 my lab assignment um, by tomorrow night, okay? Um, but with that, we're gonna go ahead and move to 5.2. And so I guess in a way it's okay, because we're not really gonna use any of the concepts that we learned in 2.3 to do 5.2. So 5.2 is really like its own thing. Um, it's completely different from all the stuff that we've been working on before today, okay? Um, I do not know why the curriculum decided to put it in this order. I don't usually do this section until the end of the semester, but this is where they put it. So I'm just gonna follow the timeline that was given to me by my boss. So um, before we can start, we actually have to talk about what is it that we're discussing in this section, okay? So 5.2 has the label of matrix solution of linear systems. And so I just wanted to kind of recap on what in the world was a linear system um, so that then we could talk about, you know, how does that look in a matrix, okay? Um, so in a linear solution is basically when you have two or more variables and then two or more equations. And so what happens is, is you're looking for a particular X and a particular Y that has this relationship, but then at the same time, they also have this second relationship, okay? And so that's what you're doing when you're finding a solution to a system. So it's not just one answer to one equation, it's the same answer to both equations. Okay, now normally, and you don't have to worry about trying to jot all this down because I am gonna post it later. Um, but normally our equations are going to look like this, where you're gonna have some coefficient A times X, and then some other coefficient um, B times Y, and then equal to some other constant. And the same thing here, you have a coefficient for X and a coefficient for Y, and then equal to a constant. Now, depending on if this coefficient is positive or negative, it'll tell you whether there'll be a plus or a minus, right? And similarly, if this guy is a positive or a negative, it'll tell you whether this is gonna be a plus or a minus, okay? Now, this system can be written in what's called a matrix form, okay? And matrix is the singular word, matrices is the plural. So if I had more than one matrix, then they would be matrices, okay? Um, this word here, element, it's basically one of the people that are inside the matrix, right? So right here, I have six elements in this matrix. Um, we also have something that are called rows and columns, right? That's what makes up the matrix. So in this particular matrix, you have two rows, but then you have three columns. Okay, um, and then we have something called an augmented matrix. An augmented matrix means it came from a system. So you had a system and then you turned it into a matrix. It's called an augmented matrix, okay? Which is different than just a regular matrix that looked like a matrix when it was given to you. Whereas this was not a matrix when it was given to me, but then I turned it into one and so now it's called an augmented matrix, okay? And then we also have something called the dimensions of your matrix. And your dimensions are always going to be um, the number of rows by the number of columns. Oops, I didn't spell that right. So for instance, this matrix here, if I were to tell you the dimensions of this matrix, it would be the number of rows, which happens to be two rows 
by the number of columns and there happens to be three columns, right? So when we say it, we say two by three, but when you see it written down, they might put like an X symbol in between. It's the same thing, two by three or with a little X, it's two by three. But that would be the dimension of the matrix, okay? Now, when we take our linear system and we turn it into this augmented matrix, the goal of this entire section, like all this process that's written out over here, the entire goal is to basically turn this into this, okay? Where no matter what these numbers are, you eventually want to turn them into one, zero, and then zero, one. And whatever results over here, it will probably be different numbers than these numbers, but whatever results over there is basically where you're going to get your answer from. Okay. Notice here, these letters were the coefficients of the variable x, right? And these letters here were the coefficients of the variable y. And then this bar kind of symbolizes the equal sign. And then these numbers over here were actually our constants, right? So that's how you create these matrices. You're gonna be putting the coefficient of the X, then the coefficient of the Y, the bar, and then your constant, okay? You do not ever put X or Y inside the matrix. The matrix should only have numbers unless for some odd reason, they gave you a matrix with the variable in it and told you to figure out what that variable is. There is a problem like that I think I've seen somewhere. So just giving a heads up. Um, but when we're asked to find a quote unquote augmented matrix, there should be no letters in it, just numbers, okay? Um, but once you convert it into this form, notice this is still your X column, this is still your Y column, and this is still your constant column. So essentially what you're saying is that one X and no Ys equals G. Well, that's the same thing as saying that X equals G, okay? And the bottom row is saying that no Xs, but one Y equals H. So that's the same as saying Y equals H. And if you put these numbers in their point form, right? It would always be the X value number first and then the Y value number second. Right, they always have to be in that order. So you have to pay attention to like my math lab or my lab math, because sometimes it says X equals and has a box and then Y equals and has a box. And then sometimes it just has like a point and you, it wants to know the actual point together. Now, the hard part, and that's what all of these words are trying to explain, the hard part is, how do I turn this into this? That is the whole lesson today, okay? So how do we get all of those numbers, as weird and different as they may be, how do we turn them into ones and zeros? And specifically in those particular spots, right? Um, what we have, these are basically like our rules, right? These are our constraints. When we are doing matrix calculations, we can only do these three things, okay? Um, so one of the things that we can do is interchange any two rows. <clears throat> Would it matter if I wrote the equations like this? Or if I wrote them like this? they're the exact same two equations, right? It doesn't matter if one of them is on top of the other, whatever the answer is has to work in this equation and this one, right? And whatever the answer is over here has to work in the exact same two equations. So it really doesn't matter whether my system is written like that or like that. It's the same system, okay? And so because these are the exact same system, that's why we are allowed to change any two rows because our rows come from those entire equations. So instead of writing this equation on top in matrix form, you could put it at the bottom if you wanted to. 
okay? That could come in handy. And I'm gonna give you an example right here. If I were to put this one into matrix form, I'm gonna put my equal bar in right here. I would have this coefficient, then that guy's coefficient, and then my constant. For the bottom equation, I would have his invisible one coefficient. I'd have a positive four coefficient for y, and then I'd have a five constant, right? But look at the goal. Isn't the goal to have a one at the top corner, right? And so I could get that, I could have that happen really simply by just interchanging these two. If I put that on the top, now the one, four, five is on the top and the two negative three, four is at the bottom, which now matches this system, okay? So they are equivalent and you can swap those rows. It's just like writing one equation on top versus another. But you would prefer this matrix because it already has the one right where you need it, okay? Now I'm gonna go over a couple of more things that we are able to do. This one said multiply or divide elements of any row by any non-zero number. Um, however, that can get really weird or confusing. So I scratched out the word divide. You basically are only ever gonna multiply a row by something, okay? And it does have to be a non-zero number. You cannot multiply a row by zero. What is it gonna do? It's gonna turn everything to zero, right? So don't multiply by zero. But if I wanted to divide by two, I could do that with multiplication. It's the exact same thing as multiplying it by one half, right? So if you're gonna divide by a number, it's the exact same thing as multiplying by its reciprocal. You basically just flip it over, okay? Similarly, if I wanted to divide by negative three fifths, I could also multiply by the reciprocal, which would be five over negative three, okay? And so we'll always be multiplying by something. We won't ever be dividing, okay? It just cuts on the less things you have to remember, okay? Now, the last thing I can do, and this one's a little bit more confusing, is you can replace any row in your matrix by the sum of the elements of that row and a multiple of the elements in another row. So it's very important that we understand this language here because which row is getting replaced? The row getting replaced is not the one that is a multiple, okay? It's the one that is not a multiple that is getting replaced. So notice it says, replace any row of the matrix by the sum of the elements of that row. So that row is the one that gets replaced and a multiple of the elements in another row, okay? So if I give you this as an example, I know what I need to do to get a zero and I'll explain to you how and why in a minute, but I'm just gonna do it for now. So you can see me do this, this step, this thing that they're telling me I'm allowed to do. What I wanna do is I wanna do negative two times row one, and then I'm gonna add row two. And that's gonna give me a new row. But which row is it gonna give me new? Only the one that did not get multiplied by something is the one that's gonna get replaced. So notice that this one did not get multiplied by anything. So that is the row that will get replaced, okay? And I like to do the computation on the side. Some people like to do it in their head, but the more I personally do in the head, the more likely I'm to make a mistake. So I'm gonna try to do this on the side. So everybody in row one is gonna get multiplied by negative two. So that would make negative two. Four times negative two is negative eight. And five times negative two is negative 10. Then I'm going to add the elements in row two. And so negative two plus two is zero, negative eight plus negative three is negative 11, and negative 10 plus four is negative six. And what is that? That's gonna become my new row two. 
So the bottom row will become zero, negative 11, and negative six. The top row though, we never, um, trying to make this little panel bar go away. Ah, I did something. There it goes. So we never did anything with the top row. We used it, right? We multiplied it by something, but it's not the one getting replaced, which means that the top row just gets rewritten again. It does not change at all. The only one changing is row two. But notice now I'm halfway to my goal, right? Because the goal we set at the beginning was to get one zero and zero one. And I've already got this going on. I just need to work on this side, okay? Now, I'm not gonna finish this problem. We're gonna have plenty of examples, but I just wanted to, wanted to show you what this step looks like, okay? So how do I know? And so I just gave you some examples. Notice here, this one got multiplied by two, right? And this one didn't. So this is the one that will become the new row. And I used a capital letter to describe the new one. Sometimes I write in and then R, but sometimes I use capital R. You just need to do something for yourself so that you know which one was the old one and which one's the new one, okay? Whether you do like I did in R or you write capital two R and then the two, whatever symbol you need to tell yourself that this is the new guy. Okay. Notice here though, on this one, I said row one plus row two, but neither one of them is getting multiplied by something, right? So that means that I have the choice there to either replace row one or to replace row two, because neither one of these had a multiple in front of it. Okay. Whereas this one, this one, I don't have a choice because although it doesn't look like there's a coefficient in the front, this one actually does have a coefficient and it's a negative invisible one, okay? And so that one was getting multiplied by a negative one. And so then I cannot replace R2. I would have to replace R1 since he's the one that did not get multiplied by absolutely anything, okay? Now I'm gonna zoom in right here because I know it's a lot of words <laughs> and we need to read them and we need to understand what they say. So let me zoom in as best as I can and I'll fix my focus because it's a little out of focus. There we go, much better. Okay, so for here, this is the steps and, and, and you'll see it better when it's in action than in words, but I am gonna go through the words, okay? So the first step is to always obtain the one as the first element of the first column using the multiplication of the reciprocal, okay? Remember, it doesn't matter what number you have. If I have the number five and I multiply it by its reciprocal, don't I get one? If I have a number like negative, three fifths and I multiply by its reciprocal, I'm gonna get one. It would be negative 15 over negative 15, which is still one. Positive one, okay? So that is essentially how you will change elements to a one, is you will always multiply by its reciprocal. What it doesn't matter what sign it is, if it's a negative, you, you, your reciprocal is negative. If it's a positive, your reciprocal is positive. You're just flipping the fraction over, okay? Um, that is literally how you obtain a one. So every time I wanna get a one somewhere, I'm going to be multiplying by the reciprocal of whatever it is that is in that position. Again, you'll see it played out in a minute, okay? Once you have that first one, so essentially what you do is you want this guy to become a one first. Oh, you can't see because I'm zoomed in. There we go. Let me move my little table out of the way. There we go. Okay. So this first element, you want that guy to become a one first. Then your second 
job is to use that first row, this one that you just worked on to get that to turn into a one, you're gonna use that first row to transform the remaining entries in the first column to zero, which means now you wanna change this guy to zero next, because that's the only other guy in that column. Then the next step is to obtain a one as the second element of the second column. So here we have a column, not the first element of this column, the second element of this column. So then you want this to turn into a one third. And we already know how to do that. You multiply by the reciprocal, okay? Then once you get that one, you're gonna cleverly use it which means you're gonna multiply it by something and then add it. <laughs> but you're gonna cleverly use it to then change this guy to a zero four, okay? And those are basically your four steps. I don't think that we have any um, crazy matrices like three by three matrices or four by four matrices like where they're really complicated. Um, but if we did, you would have to turn this to a one first then a zero, then a zero, if there were three. Then you would turn the middle guy into a one and then the guy on the top and the guy in the bottom to a zero. Then you would turn the bottom corner into a one and then turn the top two guys into a zero. But you always get a one in the column in the correct spot. And then you use that one to turn the rest of the guys in the column to zero, okay? But we will talk about how and what, what, is, what are we looking for, okay, when we try to do that. And it just says continue in this manner as far as possible until you basically get that matrix of like a diagonal of ones and then zeros everywhere else, okay? Now, as we're doing all these computations, you're gonna get some number over here and you're gonna get some number over there, okay? And depending on what those numbers are, that will tell you your solution, okay? Um, and so we do proceed with this process column by column. So you have to completely transform one whole column to the way you want it before you can move on to the next column, okay? Um, and then the same thing, you wanna go also from row to row. So if you change the one first, then you wanna change these guys in the column and then you need to move over to the next one and the one needs to be in the next uh, row. So again, we don't have any crazy big matrices. So let's try to see one of these in action. Now, for me on this sheet of paper, it just says solve, but I noticed in your homework, it asks you like different questions. So I wanted to do answer those different questions with the same example, okay? So we have just one system of equations right there. And some of the questions that you might see in the MyLab math is, just for you to turn it into an augmented matrix. So what is the augmented matrix? That's all they're gonna ask you for on some of the problems. And I think on the final exam too, one of the questions is what's the augmented matrix? So this one's really nice because it's actually really easy, okay? You're literally going to put in the X coefficients, then the Y coefficients, your bar, and then your constants. That's the format. So for the first equation, that's going to be your first row. The second equation is going to be your second row. So what are all the numbers that go in here? The coefficient of x is three. The coefficient of y is actually negative four. And then the constant over here is one. Now for the second equation, the coefficient in front of x is five here. The coefficient in front of y is positive two, and then the constant here is positive 19. And that's all they'll ask you to do on some of the problems in my math lab. And that's all they'll ask you to do on one of the questions on the final exam, possibly even the test too, because I usually like to give you the same problems that you'll see on the final exam, like throughout the semester. So you probably have one like that on the review and on the test. Then the second part, for me, it's the second part. In my math lab, there might be a whole nother problem. But this one says, what's the size of this matrix? Okay, when they say the word size, 
they're also asking for the dimensions. Dimensions. Sorry, I'm awful at spelling. I have to sound it out. Okay. And remember, we talked about that at the beginning. I know some people came in a little bit after we mentioned it, but it's always going to be the number of rows by the number of columns. So looking at this that we got from part A, how many rows does it have? You can, those that have a camera on, you can show me with fingers. Those that are off camera, you can come off mute or type it in the chat. But what would be that first dimension? Uh, two. Yes, I have two rows, right? And then what would be the number of columns? Yes, three. And again, they don't normally write the word by, but that's how you say it. They usually write it like this. It's two by three. And if you were to actually multiply those, you get the number of elements in the whole thing, don't you? Right? Two times three is six, and there are six elements in here. So those are two of the kinds of questions you'll see. Um, another kind of question is, um, thank you, Amaya, for typing in the chat, um, is where they give you the matrix and then they ask you to write the system of equations, okay? And so essentially it's the same format, but you're just going in the reverse, right? So we do know that this should be equation one. I'm gonna get a different color just because there's too much purple and I don't want this to bleed into that. So this should be equation one and this should be equation two. And this should still be the X column, the Y column, and then the constants. And remember this bar symbolizes the equal sign, okay? So when I'm writing this out, that first equation is gonna have this coefficient for X. So for x, then it's gonna have this coefficient for y, six y. It's gonna have an equal sign and then my constant is 14. However, you have to have something in the middle. It either needs to be plus or it needs to be minus. And because this six was positive six, it will be a plus. If you don't put that plus in there, it will count it wrong, okay? That plus has to be in there. Now for the bottom equation, the coefficient in front of X is three. And here it's a little bit more obvious, right? Because the coefficient of Y is negative four. And when you write that down, you already have the minus in the middle, don't you? So that one was a little bit more straightforward. The other one you had to remember to put a plus in the middle. And that's it, that's all they want from you is just this, this system, whatever that is, okay? Now here's part D. And, and since you have two matrices on the piece of paper, I tried to tell you which one we should be looking at. So it says, using the matrix from part A, so using this matrix, perform negative three times row one, added to row two and fill in the blanks. So they're really testing you to see if you know which one's gonna get replaced, okay? Because the other one should be staying the same. So if I'm going to do this, negative three times row one plus row two, just writing that down in symbols, which one is the one that's going to get replaced? Row one one or row two? Mm -hmm. It is row two. And do we remember why? Does it have a multiplier in the front? No multiplier, right? So this is the one that's going to get replaced. And since it's gonna be the new one, I'm gonna use capital R, okay? Which means, is the top one ever gonna get replaced? No. So those entries 
should stay exactly the same in the final answer. But what I do need to do is figure out what's gonna go in the bottom row. And so this is the part where I actually like to do the computation. I don't try to do it in my head. So I take row one and each one of these entries in row one is gonna get multiplied by negative three. So three times negative three is negative nine. Negative four times negative three is actually a positive 12. And then one times negative three is negative three. Then I'm going to put row two's entries right underneath it. And we're supposed to be adding these together. So negative nine plus five is negative four. Positive 12 plus two is positive 14. Negative three plus 19 is actually positive 16. And so that, those three entries will become my new row two. So then this becomes negative four, 14, and then 16. Now we didn't get any ones or zeros, right? So they weren't asking me to solve it. They just wanted to see if I knew which one to replace and if I knew how to do that computation. Part E is gonna be the big one. Part E wants me to actually solve the system. And I'm solving the original problem that they gave me up there. So I'm gonna use the augmented matrix here to start talking about it. I just wanna rewrite it because it's way up top. So I need to solve this system. So we have to remember the order and then how to get ones and zeros, right? Always use the reciprocal to get ones and the zeros, I'll talk about how to do that one in a second, okay? Just a little side note before we continue. Um, I did have somebody ask me a question about the test. The test was supposed to be Thursday, but it's not gonna be Thursday because I don't even know that we'll be able to finish this whole section today. We'll most likely have to finish it Thursday, but I definitely want you guys to start looking at the review, like work on 5.2, but also work on uh, the test one review because on Thursday, I'm gonna finish up whatever we don't get to from 5.2. And then I'm also gonna answer any questions that you guys have about um, the test review, okay? The test review is very much like the test. The test just has less questions because you don't have a whole bunch of time, right? You have all day and night, the whole week, the whole the whole like first month of school <laughs> to work on that review. But we only have like what, an hour, two hours to work on the test. So there cannot be that many questions, okay? But they are very similar to the ones on the reviews. And I do, um, the question that someone asked me was, are you guys gonna be allowed to use notes on the test and the, the 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 test is open notes so you could use whatever notes you want i don't suggest that you have your whole entire notebook with you just because you might waste time shuffling through it but if you look at that review anything that you would have needed for that review i would make sure that you have that on like an extra little set of papers just so that you have everything you would absolutely need okay it just cuts it all the having to shuffle through all your notes to find out what you need. Have your notes available just in case for some reason what you need is not in your little stack, but try to condense it. It'll be more beneficial to you, okay? Just time-wise. Okay, so for E, for solving the system, we have to change this guy first. We don't have a choice. Now I like to use symbols. That's just how I am so that I can remind myself what I'm doing and what order I'm doing it in. So I like to use boxes when I'm changing something to a one and I will use circles when I'm trying to change it to a zero, okay? Just cause the box looks more like a stick, like the number one, and then the circle looks more like a zero, right? So that's how I tell myself what I'm doing. So my goal is to change this three into a one. And I know specifically how to do it because the rules told me specifically how to do it. All you have to do is multiply the reciprocal. What is the reciprocal of three? 
If I write three as a fraction, isn't it three over one? Right? So then it's reciprocal would be the reverse, which would be one over three, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I want to multiply this by one over three so that I could get that one. But you can't just multiply one element. You have to multiply the whole entire row. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do one third times row one, okay? And I'm not adding anything. So I am going to replace row one. It's only when you're adding two of them together that you have to decide who's gonna get replaced, okay? But here I'm just doing something to one row. So that of course is the row that's going to get replaced. I'm doing nothing to row two. So I'm just gonna rewrite it. Now, what do I get when I do three times one third? What on earth is in my calculator? Three times one third is just one. So this one is just gonna be one. I don't wanna use this color. Then what about negative four times one third? And if you could do these computations in your head, by all means, go for it. But I like to write them down or at least put them in my calculator just to be sure, especially off over a long day, my brain starts doing weird things. Like I can't even multiply this and I should know better, right? One times anything is the same thing, right? <laughs> so when I do one times one third, it should be one third. So we've met the goal for the top one. That one's good, it's ready to go. It's a one just like it should be. But then who's supposed to be next? I cannot just do them in whatever order I want. If you do that, and this is why, if you try to do it in a different order, what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna change somebody to a zero and then you're gonna change it back to another number. And then you're gonna change it back to a zero and then you're gonna change it back to another number. <laughs> and so to create, you know, to avoid all of that cycling, that's why you have to do it in this specific order, okay? So the next one is this guy. I have to finish a whole column before I can move to the next column, okay? And you always have to get your ones first because you're gonna use those ones to get the zeros. Now, I want this to be zero, okay? And I wanna replace that whole bottom row. But the direction said that I had to use the row with the one to change this one. Well, the only operation that allows me to do that is if I add the two matrices together, right? You can multiply one of them by something, but you gotta add them together. And since I'm trying to change the second row, that is the one that I'm going to have to add so that I can get a new second row. What I need to know though, is what number am I gonna multiply row one by? What number am I gonna multiply row one by so that I can get a zero right there? Okay, so what number would basically cancel out five? Negative five? Mm -hmm. You got it, negative five. So if I multiply this guy by negative five and then I add it to five, don't I get the zero? right? So we will always use the opposite of this number that you're trying to change to a zero. And when I say opposite, that's different than reciprocal, okay? Opposite means one thing and reciprocal means another thing. Reciprocal means to flip. Opposite just means a different sign. So it's the same exact number, but just a different sign. So this one was positive five, so I have to use negative five, okay? And it will always be that way. So in order for you to get the zeros, you're always gonna multiply the, the row with the one in it by the opposite of the number you're trying to turn to zero. So now let's do the computation because that's not something I like to do in my head, although some people do. They go, oh, negative five times one is negative five plus five is zero. And then they just write the answer but I like to do the math on the side, especially if you go so many steps, 
steps and then you get a wrong answer, at least you can backtrack where it went wrong. And you don't have to just start the whole thing from scratch. So all of the guys in row one are gonna get multiplied by negative five. I am gonna need some help with the calculator for these guys. So one times negative five is negative five. Negative four over three times negative five is 20 over three. And then one third times negative five is negative five over three. If you cannot do that in your head, please do not try. Type it in the calculator, it will tell you negative five. So I type negative one fourth times the negative five and it gives me 20 over three, okay? Same thing with the one third. One over three times negative five and it gives me negative five over three, okay? especially with the fractions. If you gotta use a calculator, please do. I'd rather you use the calculator and get the right answers than try to do it in your head and get the wrong answers, right? So row two goes right underneath, but I gotta add them. And then now it works. Negative five plus five, that is a zero. Now I'm gonna do it over here. Negative five plus five, yep. Now 20 over three plus two, is 26 over three. Negative five over three plus 19 is 52 over three. And the nice thing about the calculator is if you are using it for these additions, um, it will already reduce the fraction for you and everything if it can be reduced, okay? So you don't have to wonder, oh, can this be reduced? If the calculator didn't do it, then no. Okay, so now I'm going to go back here. And remember, this is going to be my new row two right there, which means row one stays the same as it should because you don't want to change that little one that's there, right? That was part of the goal. But now the bottom row becomes this. And so we need to keep with that pattern. We now we're finished with that first column. We have one and zero. Now we can move to the second column. However, in the second column, it's the it's backwards, right? This one is a zero and that one is a one. And remember the kind of little rule, you have to get the one first so that you can use it to get the zero. So I don't have a choice. I have to do this first and get that to turn to a one. And we know how to turn things to a one. We just multiply by the reciprocal. So if I wanna multiply by this reciprocal, that would be three over 26. And I'm in row two. So that's gonna give me my new row two. This is like when it's only one thing, one row happening, you don't need to do all that, right? But when you have two rows involved, you do need to do all this, okay? Some people do it in their head, but I just do not. I choose not to. It's too much. So first row is not changing, only the second one. So I'm going to keep all of these guys exactly the same. And now let's see what happens when we start this process. So zero times anything is still zero which is good because we don't want that to change, right? And then this times the reciprocal, we know it's supposed to be one, but if you're not sure, you can always just double check. But it does come out to equal one when you multiply those together. Now I have to multiply 52 over three times this reciprocal three over 26. Everybody in row two has to get multiplied by three over 26. Oh, we got lucky that one came out nice, right? So now we're going back to normal numbers, not fractions, <laughs> which is good. But that doesn't mean you can't have fraction answers. Sometimes your answers will be fractions. Don't use decimals though, if the decimals don't end. Like if I try to do one third, where one over three, it doesn't reduce it, but if I try to do the double arrow, notice that it has this repeating decimal, right? Which is different than one half. 
that's just 0. 0.5. So if your decimal, if your fraction was one half, you could use the decimal version, it's totally okay. But if your fraction is one third, you cannot use this decimal because you're you're gonna have to chop it off at some point and then it's not the exact same thing as one third, okay? It's close to one third, but it's not exactly one third. And so your answers will be off if you try to use the decimals for fractions that have like ongoing decimals, okay? Don't, don't just stay with the fractions and you'll be fine. Okay, so yay, we're three fourths of the way done. We've got one more thing to do. And that's to change this guy to a zero, okay? But how do we do it? We're going to multiply its opposite. So same number, but a different sign, okay? Same number, different sign. And what are we multiplying it by? This one, so that it can change that to a zero. And this one is in row two. So we're gonna do four thirds times row two plus the top row so that I can replace that top row. Remember the one that does not have a multiple is the one that gets replaced. So now let's take row two and multiply all of these guys by four thirds. So zero times four thirds is still zero. One times four thirds is four thirds. Two times four thirds is eight thirds. And if you need to do any of those computations in your calculator, please do. Not a big deal. Then we're going to add row one underneath it. So one, negative four thirds, and one third. And we're adding these together. So zero and one added together is one, four thirds take away four thirds, what, exactly what we thought was gonna happen, right? It's gonna turn to zero. And then for this one, if you need to use a calculator, do so. If not, you might already know what the answer is. It's nine thirds, right? But nine thirds is actually three. So you just get three here. And that's my new row one, right? So my new row one is gonna become one, zero, and then three. My bottom row is not changing in this step, so it's gonna stay zero, one, and two. We have completed the goal. The goal was to make this side of the bar have that diagonal of ones, and then the other two entries were zeros, okay? So we met the goal. Now we just have to go back. Remember up here at the top when they gave me a matrix and they asked me to put it into its system? There's a reason they want you to practice that and it's because that's how you get your answer. So this is one X, right? This is the X column, this is the Y column, and this is the constant column. And this little thing, the bar is the equal sign. So I have one X, which I'm not gonna write the invisible one. So it's just one X but I have no y's equal to three. And for the bottom equation, I have no x's, but I have one y equal to two. And so then if the computer has this, then you're simply just gonna type in three for x and two for y. But if the computer has this, then you need to enter it in its point form, okay? And so in that case, the three would have to go in the spot where the X is at, and the two would have to go in the spot where the Y is at. Now, graphically, um, we don't talk too, too much about the graphs of them, but graphically, I'm actually gonna address it over here and then I'll go to another page. Graphically, what you're looking for is the point at which they intersect. So essentially what's happening is you have equation one, which represents a line, 
and you have equation two, which represents a line, and they intersect at this point. So those two equations that they gave us at the beginning happen to intersect across each other at this point, three, two. So if I were to graph one equation and then graph the other one, you notice that they would cross at three, two, okay? That's a system that has one unique solution. So there's only one answer, that's where they cross, right there in the middle, okay? But there are other kinds of solutions. What happens if the two lines are parallel to each other? Then they never touch, right, ever. And since they never touch, there's no answer. They don't touch at all. There's no solution when they're parallel to each other. And then the last case is what if they're on top of each other? What if one line is just a multiple of the other line? And when you graph them, they look like the exact same thing, okay? Well, in that case, don't they touch everywhere if they're on top of each other? This one's going in that direction forever, so is that one, okay? So if both of the lines are going forever in the same direction and they're on top of each other, you have an infinite number of solutions. This point is a solution, this point is a solution, this one, this one, this one, they're all solutions, right? Every single point on this line is a solution. And because it's going forever in that direction and forever in this direction, there are infinitely many solutions. Now, with that one, you have to be very careful. Yes, it has infinitely many solutions. It doesn't mean that every point is a solution. Is this point over here on those lines? This point right there is not on those lines. So this point right here is not a solution, but this point is a solution. And so how do you tell the person where all the points are? Are, right? You're going to have to use one of those equations, okay? And so we'll talk about those a little more when we get to them, but not yet. We still need some practice with this matrix stuff. So I'm going to flip my page over because I do want to practice some more. And we're doing okay on time. We still have about 20, about 20 minutes. So we should probably be able to get through the next ones. Now, I'll just show you this part right here, just in case um, you see it on your homework. We we're not gonna get to these examples just yet today, probably, but I just want you to see what happens. So what happens is, is when you're working on your matrices, you're gonna change this guy to a one, and then you're gonna change this guy to a zero, and then your goal is gonna be to change this guy to a one. And what's gonna end up happening is, is it's gonna become a zero, okay? When you turn that guy into a zero, this one's also gonna turn into a zero, okay? You can never change a zero into a one. Why can I never change a zero into a one? Because remember how we change things to a one? We multiply by the reciprocal. Well, if I have the number zero, that's the same as saying zero over one. And if I try to find the reciprocal, that would be one over zero. That's not a number. That's an undefined value, okay? And I can't multiply by an undefined number. That doesn't even make any sense, right? So there's no earthly way to change the zero into a one. And so it's stuck like that as a zero. If that happens to you, where you get stuck with that one spot being a zero, when you know you gotta turn it into a one, then you're just gonna have to look and see what's on this side. Okay, if you get a zero, then you have infinitely many solutions because zeros do equal a zero, don't they, right? Whereas if you don't have a zero over here and you have some other number, zero does not equal some other number. That's just not true. And so when you have this false statement right here, it's going to be no solution, okay? So maybe next class we'll get to those and I want you to see like two more examples outside of the ones we're gonna do today. Um, and then we also have a word problem that we wanna talk about at the end of this section. But for now, I wanna practice some of the ones that I know are gonna have just one answer, okay? And then we'll talk about the weird ones later <laughs> next class some more, okay? 
So I'm gonna turn my page over and we're gonna try to do these two. Maybe we'll have enough time, maybe we won't, but we'll see. So we wanna try to do, we don't do three by threes in this class. So I just crossed it out and found two of them in your homework. And so those are the two I have. Yours might have different numbers, but it, what's gonna happen is kind of the same thing. So for this one, in order for me to start, I have to have it in a matrix. So we're gonna write our augmented matrix. So remember, we're looking for the X column, the Y column, and then the constant column. So then my coefficient is going to be negative 25, negative 3, and negative 10. For the bottom equation, it's positive 10, positive 1, and then positive 5. Now this one is like in the right spot, but as I try to change this to a one and this to a zero, that one may change in the process. And if it does, it's okay because we know how to change it back later, okay? But we have to go in the correct order. So the first job is to turn this into a one. And to do that, I'm going to do the reciprocal. So if 20, negative 25 were over one and I flip it, it would be one over negative 25. And I'm gonna multiply that by the top row to get me my new top row. Cause then I want the one where that pink box is at, right? So let's see, what do we get? Um, on negative 25 times one over negative 25 is of course the one I needed. Negative three times one over negative 25 is positive three over 25. And then negative 10 times one over negative 25 is positive two fifths. So that's what I have for my new row one. Now row two, nothing is happening with that, right? So it's just gonna stay exactly the way it was. Only do one thing at a time, okay? There are some people who try to do multiple steps in one time and it will come out wacky. So just change one row at a time. You essentially should have four steps, right? Because you're changing him, then him, then him, then him, kind of going like in a U shape, right? So you should have four steps, unless you get lucky and that guy's already a one, then you only have three steps. Next, so I'm going down the line, I change that to a one, this one has to get changed to a zero. How do I do that? I use the opposite of this number. So negative 10 times row one, and I'm adding row two so that I could get a new row two. So the one without the number, is the one that becomes the new one. And here I do have to do like actual math. So let's see, this guy times negative 10 is negative 10. This guy times negative 10 simplifies. So let me actually do it in the calculator. Times negative 10. I knew it was gonna reduce. And then two over five times negative 10. So that one, we get negative four. Then I'm gonna add row two. So positive 10, one, and five. And we're gonna add these. So negative 10 plus 10 is zero. Negative six over five plus one is negative one over five. And then negative four plus five is just positive one. There we go. Okay, now that became my new row two, right? So when I write my matrix, these guys are going to become my row two. 
row one is not changing. So it stays exactly the same as it was in the line before or in the matrix before. Now I can move over to the next column and this guy has to turn into a one first. And how do we do the ones? We use the reciprocal, right? So if it's negative one over five, we're gonna do five over negative one. And this is in the bottom row. So we're gonna multiply it by row two. And that will become our new row two, hopefully with a one in that spot where the pink box is at. So row one's not changing. I'm gonna write it down. But row two is changing. Zero times this is still zero. Five over negative one times negative one over five is the positive one that we were looking for. And now for that guy, one times anything is the same thing, right? One times negative, oops, five over negative one. But it does simplify. To negative five. Finally, we're on our last one. This guy needs to change to a zero. And so to do that, we're going to use its opposite, not its reciprocal, but its opposite. So we're going to do negative three over 25 times one of the rows plus one of the rows to get me a new row. Okay. We just need to figure out which one. Which one is the one that needs to change? This pink one is the one that needs to change, right? And that's in row two. So row two is the one that needs to be replaced. Well, only the one that doesn't have a number in front is the one that would get replaced. So that means this needs to be row two and that needs to be row one. It's just another way to backtrack to figure out which one goes where. Okay, now here we go multiplying row one by this number here. Or no, I said it wrong, didn't I? Somebody was looking at me all crazy. <laughs> Which row is the pink circle in? Use your fingers, one or two. Which row is the pink circle in? In row one. <laughs> So that's the one that needs to be the new one then, right? And since that's the one that needs to be the new row, that's the one I'm adding, which means the one that's getting multiplied is row two. Makes sense because I'm supposed to be using this to get rid of that. And how when they say using this, they mean multiply this by something to turn that into a zero. Okay, so I do have to multiply row two by something, to turn that into a zero. Now let's do that. So zero times this number is zero. One times this number will be the exact same number. And negative five times this number, I think is three fifths, but let me make sure because my brain does do weird stuff sometimes. It's three fifths, positive though. And then underneath it, I'm gonna put just row one. So one, three over 25, two over five. So here we get one, these guys are opposite. So I'll get zero. And here I would get five over five, which is one. But if you're not sure, you can always add in the calculator, right? So this computation does come out to zero. And this computation comes out to one, okay? So that one was zero. And when I added those, I did get one. And so that's my new row one. I'm gonna draw an arrow and go all the way up here. So my new row one becomes one, zero, and one. My row two is not changing. It's zero, one, and negative five.
So we've got that there. And then up top, notice that the top row changed to 0, 1, 0, right? 0, 1, 0. And the bottom row stayed the same as it was. So 0, 1, and negative 5. But now I've met my goal. I've performed my four steps. I'm done. All I'm going to say is that this 1x equals this number. And this 1y equals that number. And so in point form, my answer would be 1, comma, negative 5. We might not finish this one, but I want to at least talk about how to set it up, OK? Because if you notice, this one is not right. It's not ready for me to put it into a matrix. Because we talked about at the very beginning that your equations needed to look like this. They have to look like that before I can put them into a matrix. So your constants have to be on the right side of the equal sign. And your x's have to be in front and then the y's next. Now we do have that, right? Don't I have my x's and then my y's, my x's and then my y's? Like that's not the problem. The problem is, is that these constants are not on the correct side, okay? So in order for me to move a positive 69, I would have to subtract 69 on both sides of the equation. And in order for me to move this negative 28, I would have to add 28 to both sides of the equation which means that the system would become negative 15x, negative 3y, and then on the other side would be the negative 69. For the second equation, you have that positive 6x, you have this positive y, but then when the 28 moved over, it became positive 28. Now it's in the right format for me to put it into to a matrix, okay? So when I put it in the matrix, we're gonna have the number in front of X, then the number in front of Y, and then the constant. And in the second equation, the number in front of X, the number in front of Y, which is actually invisible, it's an invisible positive one, and then the constant over here, which is 28. Okay, now let's see if we could do this one. Since we kind of got the hang of things, we should be able to go a little bit faster because they shouldn't take that long. I know they seem like they're real long, but they shouldn't take that long. So the first one is to change this guy to a one. So to do that, I need the reciprocal. So I can get my new row one. And that's gonna be a little bit weird. So I'm gonna put my calculator right next to me. One over negative 15 times negative 15. I get the one I wanted. Uh, one over negative 15 times negative three. I get one fifth. And then one over negative 15 times negative six, nine, I get 23 over five. Nothing is happening to the bottom row. So it's gonna stay exactly the same. Next is to change this guy to a zero. So I need the opposite of six, which is negative six. And it's gonna get multiplied by row one so that I can replace that row two. So all of the guys in row one times negative six. So negative six, negative six fifths, and negative, what is 23 times six? Negative 138 over five. Then row two goes right underneath six, one and 28 and we add so we get zero 
Oh gosh, I think that's negative one fifth, but I'm gonna double check. Plus one. Okay, good. This one, I'm not even gonna waste brain power. It's too difficult. Um, plus 28. Nice, I did not expect that, but it's just two fifths. So now we're gonna remember, we're replacing row two. So this is gonna become row two. So we have one, one fifth and 23 over five staying unchanged, but row two is becoming zero, negative one fifth and two fifths. Next, we have to change this guy to a one and to change to ones, we use reciprocal. So to get ones reciprocal, to get zeros opposites. So we're gonna do five over negative one times row two to give me a new row two. So my capitals always represent my new, my new rows. So row one's gonna stay the same. And zero times this is just zero. Negative one fifth times five over negative one is one. And negative or two over five times five over negative one is going to be negative two. And if you're not sure, type it in. Two over five times five over negative one. It gives you negative two. So the more fractions you can do in your head, the faster you'll be able to do the problem, but you always have your calculator, okay? And then the last is to get this guy to turn to a zero. So I'll use the opposite, which is negative one fifth. And I'm gonna multiply that by row two so that I could get my new row one, right? You don't wanna multiply the row you're trying to change by anything. So let's see, zero times negative one fifth is zero. One times negative one fifth is negative one fifth. Negative two times negative one fifth is positive two fifths. And then I'm gonna add row one. So here's all of row one. So zero plus one is one. Opposites added together is zero. Two fifths plus 23 fifths is actually 25 fifths and 25 divided by five is five. But again, if you need the calculator, don't be afraid to use it. It does spit out just five. Now that's my new row one, right? So row one becomes these guys. Row two is gonna stay exactly as they were. But I have finished the problem. So the top one tells me that X equals five and the bottom equation tells me that Y equals negative two. So my point of intersection is five comma negative two. Okay, we finished just, just in time. So we have not finished all of 5.2. We will continue because the next time we're gonna actually get to those weird ones where the answer could be no solution or infinitely many solutions. And that way we know what we're supposed to be typing in the computer when we get to those problems, okay? But as long as you're able to get one, zero, one, zero, you should have an answer. If in the process of getting these guys, both of these turn to zero, then stop, because we haven't talked about those yet, okay? We kind of talked about them, but not, not fully. But other than that, guys, if you have any questions for me, let me know. If not, you are free to go. And I will be posting all of this, uh, the notes and the, the video um, later as soon as, it, as soon as it pops up in my canvas. But have a good one.